All right, can, uh, can you hear me in the back of the room all right? I see a hand waving. Good. Oh, sir, do you have a question? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Discover 2021 here at Mazak. It was uh, 102 weeks ago, the last time we were all together, believe it or not. Um, I can tell you it's, it's a whole lot better seeing you all here live and in person versus uh, seeing everyone on a virtual screen. So thank you for coming, participating. Uh, we hope that uh, your visit with us uh, here today and, and tomorrow is worthwhile and you walk away with something, uh, you know, with some nuggets of real value. Um, my name is Dan Yanka, president of uh, Mazak Corporation. I remembered this time. I've forgotten to introduce myself a couple times this week, so <clears throat> and I've been reminded of it. But uh, anyway, um, we're you know we're, we're really excited uh, and honored to have the opportunity this week uh, to bring here with us uh, industry thought leaders um, to share some of their insights into manufacturing topics, such as you know when and how uh, to deploy automation in your facility, in your shop, um, economic and supply chain trends heading into 2022. Uh, we had a, a fantastic job shop, profit shop panel that was here the other day. All of these keynote speakers um, that have already occurred this week, you can access, uh, if, if you registered and downloaded the app, you'll have access um, to uh, their messages. And I gotta tell you, they, they, they were fantastic and very timely. Um, today, we're excited uh, because the focus is gonna be on digital manufacturing solutions to enhance productivity. And, and we're all interested in looking for ways to improve our productivity and drive down our costs. I'm honored to be able to introduce this morning's keynote speakers, both from the Oak Ridge National Lab Dr. Tom Kerfus, Chief Manufacturing Officer, and Dr. Kyle Salibi, Mechanical Engineer, Robotics and Additive Manufacturing. Dr. Kerfus is, was a distinguished professor at, in the Departments of Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon, Georgia Tech, and Clemson. Dr. Kerfus has held numerous leadership roles throughout the manufacturing industry including time spent as the president of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Um, he's also currently serving on the boards of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, the National Center for Manufacturing Sciences, NCMS, and the National Center for Defense Manufacturing and Machining. That has quite a few letters, NCDMM. Um, Dr. Kerf has previously served as Assistant Director for Advanced Manufacturing at the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President of the United States of America. Dr. Kerf and Dr. Salibi are going to share their thoughts and insights into a very timely topic, as I've already mentioned, digital manufacturing solutions to enhance productivity. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, we're going to have time for Q&A, so as, as, as they go through, if you have any thoughts or questions, jot them down and uh, uh, we'll be able to get to those afterwards. So without further ado, Dr. Kerfus, welcome. All right, so... Um, Thank you very much, Dan, for, for the intro. I'm Tom Kerfus, Kyle Salibi is going to be joining me in a little bit. And we're going to really be talking about some of the digital solutions that are going on. We've worked closely with Mazak uh, for many, many years and, and really showing you some of the, the, the fruits of our, our labors and so forth. And, and then the security part, Kyle is going, to, is going to really be focusing on that. And that is, look, as you start to go to digital, well, I think you hear it left and right in terms of how things are coming together. 
Now, how do you make sure that as you, you plug your machine in, yes, I mean, I understand you've got the Mazak smart box and the hell bit, but, but what are some of the things you should be thinking about? And so in particular, Kyle's going to show you some pretty cool things that are going on. Uh, and one of the things I do want to highlight is, is a lot of what's happening, this is partnerships between the U.S. government and industry. So everything we're doing is not just to do research and, gosh, this is cool and we're going to publish a paper, but it really is, if we don't have a partner either in the government, let's say the Department of Defense, Air Force, Navy, or a partner like MASAC, Building Machine Tools here in the United States, then we do not do it, right? So we are about identifying critical technologies uh, and, and scaling them up. Uh, I wanted to thank, uh, so, so you'll, you'll hear from Kyle in a little bit, but we've got Dr. Tom Feldhausen here, who's our hybrid guru, so if there are any really hard hybrid questions, which is the additive and subtractive, we'll probably just hand it over to him. Uh, and then one guy who isn't here today is Dr. Vincent Paqui, so he is, uh, he's our data analytics guru. So, but, and again, he's utilizing a lot of, if you think about TensorFlow and Amazon Web Services and all these things that you read on the paper, these are the tools that we're bringing to bear on, on, on manufacturing. And I might actually, since we're going around and talking to some of the different people over here, got some pretty cool ideas in terms of where we're going. And of course, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is a, a Department of Energy National Laboratory. Um, so again, our, our unofficial mantra is innovating technology faster than the competition can copy. And so the idea is, look, yeah, people put out, you know, hey, I got a new design, I got a new product, a new capability. I think we all know somebody is going to copy that. We won't say do, right? But it's going to be copied at some point in time. Uh, and it's sort of like your smartphone, right? Do you, do you really want the smartphone for two or three years ago? The answer is no. So we've got to keep the technology out in the forefront. It's the same thing on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is not about putting a wall up and saying, okay, you can't get in, because there will be ways to get around that wall. It is, being, it is about being kept one step ahead of the competition, you know, or, or, or you know, the, the, uh, the bad actors out there. By the way, 30% of all cyber attacks in the United States, roughly 30%, so about a third, uh, are against U.S. manufacturing operations. Primarily to get a hold of intellectual property. So, so not to mess with your machines, not to mess with your processes, but to just figure out what you're making, how you're making it, even critical things. I think we all know the secret sauce. What are the feeds and speeds? What does the G-code look like and so forth? So these are our critical. So we're all about making sure the U.S. stays dominant in advanced manufacturing. Uh, and, and really our mission is, what is the latest and greatest technology out there? And it might be at universities, it might be at different companies and so forth, some startups set up. But how do we get that scaled up and into production operations? Oh, by the way, I should have pointed out, so, so this is, is my friend Medusa. So this is an additive system that uses robots. And we've got, and you'll see it in operation, I think, in our last slide. There's a big turntable down here. Uh, and so if you want to make cylindrical objects, uh, you know, like maybe rockets and things like that, the robots come in here, and these are, these are, these are well done. So just make welders, and the table spins, and the robots just go up and produce a cylinder. So it's a little bit harder than what I explained, but that's kind of the concept, right? And so forth. But it's using wire, and in fact, one of the things we're going to be talking about is some of the hot wire machines. So no powder. I mean, powder is cool in the hell bit, but if you've dealt with powder, you've got respirators and things like that. If you do wire, you know, I could go off to our friends, for example, over Lincoln Electric, order a spool of wire, and, and you know, load it into my load it into my well, just like any shop would be doing. Um, but, but we're talking a little bit on the digital side today, and I'll, I'll roll in some of the hybrid in a little bit. But basically, it's about ubiquitous sensing. So sensing is everywhere, big data, you know, artificial intelligence, it is out there. I mean, even Google Maps, right? So, so how does Google Maps tell you where you're going and you know, give you all that traffic information? It is tracking your phone going down the road. Did you ever give it permission? Yeah, you know, when you first loaded it up 10 years ago, and it said, you know, you, had, you hit a bunch of okays, right, as you're trying to figure out how to get home from the airport or how to get around, you hit okay several times, you're giving all that away. Is it worth it? Well, you tell me how often you use Google Maps and so forth, and even rerouting. And by the way, it does figure out all the routes. How does it figure out all the great little side streets and so forth? It watches people who know those side streets and watch them, you know, watches them go down the ground. And, and again, in terms of a lot of the computing that's out there, I've thrown up there, look, this is, this is what we're using now. These are more powerful. Uh, where is it, Arduino? Which one, let's see, Arduino. Oh, there's Arduino over there. It's, it's, it's this guy down here, the Uno, right? So that's like, I don't know, $20, $30 maybe. I think maybe it's 15 <clears throat> Raspberry Pi. Hey, by the way, if you've got kids in junior high and high school, maybe even elementary school that are programming, that's what they're programming. More power than what they used to put Neil Armstrong on the moon. Right? Eight kilobytes. So Neil Armstrong, main computer, eight kilobytes. Not, not terabytes, not gigabytes, not megabytes, eight kilobytes of RAM. You know, you can't almost send a text with eight kilobytes, right? So, but they're really, they're low cost, they're disposable, they're rapidly upgradable. If, if you damage it, right, you don't even worry about getting it repaired. 
right? You can just go buy a new one, and when you buy that new one, it's probably lower cost and higher power. Uh, and then sensor, sensor, sensor. So my colleague, we have a whole machine tool group uh, over at Oak Ridge. My colleague, Scott Smith, is Mr. Machine Tool. Um, we were grad students at about the same time. He made the state, which I thought was pretty cool. Look, we spent months wiring up sensors on machines back in the 80s. Uh, you know, and then you'd run the machine for a few days and get a whole bunch of data and spend months analyzing the data. Now, every one of those machines has the sensors in them, right? So all those sensors are there, which number one tell me, hey, we did good because why? People are using our research on the machines today. But every time you take a cut, we're running one of those experiments that PhDs ran back in the 1980s, and we've got enough computing power to analyze stuff to optimize your processes. So you've got sensors everywhere, you've got processing, it's, it's pretty easy to go through. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how all of this stuff really comes together. Uh, and in this particular case, we'll talk about hybrid. We've probably seen some of the hybrids you know, there. Uh, and like I said, we've got the, the good Dr. Feldhausen, who's our guru on this area. Um, but really, it, it combines the best worlds of CNC and additive. And, and if you think about it, we've all seen stuff that's been printed out. And it's OK, and it's got an OK finish, but geometry is not particularly good. So you'd really like the machine to finish it out. It's almost like casting. Maybe you want to machine the whole thing, but maybe your mounting points and so forth, if there's some precision points. Um, so, you know, what you'd like to do, and by the way, there, there's always been a lot of thought of I could take my 3D printer and put, you know, a milling head on it. Well, I have you ever gone to any of these, you know, big 3D printers, even the smaller ones, right? They're, they're just like rubber band. It's like a Gumby machine, right? It's just so flexible. But why not stick an additive head into a machine tool? And so this is really what we're talking about here. It gives you the repeatability, the precision, great surface finish, and high productivity of, of the CNC machine. You know, uh, you know, but but also it gives you less material waste. So now I can, I you know, I can print up the casting shape as opposed to machining a block of steel or aluminum or titanium. Um, it also gives you the added part. It gives you some of that geometric freedom. I can make some pretty crazy looking parts. Uh, if you go to Oak Ridge National Laboratory, you can see this is a hand that my colleague Lonnie Love and his team printed up. Um, and you know, and, and it gives you lots of good material options. You know, I, I, I want to make this out of steel. Well, I love the steel wire into the machine. I want to make it out of aluminum. I love the aluminum wire into the machine. Uh, you know, I know, you know, a couple of parameters and so forth. Titanium is a little bit more difficult to deal with. Ink and L, et cetera, et cetera. But you can weld it. You know, we can make the we call the preform. It's like the casting. Um, and, and again, there, there are different types of machines out there and so forth. That you, you've, got, you've got sort of the laser ones that have got the blown powder so you can actually blow powder into the beam and, and work on it that way. Today we're going to focus primarily on, on, the, uh, on, on the laser one. And there's some kind of cool things going on. So this VC500, uh, we have it over at, over at Oak Ridge. We'll show you the, the latest one that we've got that, that we're just getting up and running. Uh, came in 2019. And, and it's actually, it, it is, it's got a laser and it's putting on the wire. So it's just putting down the material. Uh, and, and a couple of cool things I have to say about this. So you've got the five axis, which allows you to do you know, some interesting things. But just like, you know, let's say a constant feed rate when, when you're machining, because I want a constant, constant surface speed. Well, when I'm putting material down, you want to think about it the same way. I'm feeding wire out at a constant rate. So you can see here, as I get to the apex of this sphere, so it's slow here, I get to the apex, that table speeds up because I've got to get a constant you know, material uh, deposition rate down there and so forth. So, so there are a lot of things that are fairly similar. And what, the other thing we find out is, yeah, the faster you put down the material, the less accurate you are typically. So it's just like machining, right? You have roughing, and then when you get to your finished surface, you want to get the really good surface, the really high precision. You go to your finished cut, you take a lighter cut, lower material removal rates, and you have better accuracy and precision and so forth. Um, but the other thing that is cool, and this is what was, we're very excited about it, is, is look, you, know, you could do some pretty interesting five axis thing. So this is not a printer. So here, this is the inside of the machine. We've got the additive head laser over here. Uh, you've got your machining spindle over here. But we could produce things like this propeller uh, without any support surfaces. Because I can print this, and this, this thing was printed over on its side. You print it, then you rotate it, you print the next one, you rotate it, you print the next one. But I'm going to show you that. So again, this is not just about thinking about building the machine, but you've got to think about designing, programming things differently and so forth. And then it's also, what's the software that you're using to drive this stuff? Um, so the new, the new big one that was delivered just a little bit ago, and we're, we're, we're working on getting it up and running, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, is, is it's a, a BTC 800. So it's a, it's a ginormous machine and so forth uh, in terms of the, the height, uh, you know, uh, built envelope, so 1.5 meters, diameter about a half a meter. So we're able to print things like rocket nose cones and so forth. Uh, we have, uh, we actually have, uh, not on this particular machine, but we have actually launched a few of those. Uh, one 
Yeah, I think it's still up in orbit, right? Yeah, so we, we have one up in orbit docked with the International Space Station right now. Uh, so it's actually it's actually some pretty cool stuff and so forth. And like I said, this thing is really big. It was, uh, I, I, it was what, 5 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, right? And everybody was super, super excited. I, 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 you ever thought you'd get your key coming at 5 o'clock in the morning, but everybody wanted to see this thing get offloaded. So it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, we'll have uh, more, more on that next time we come up. But, but again, so here are some things, you know, and, and so this, again, software is also a key part of it. So it's trajectory planning, right? And, and now, again, if you think about, yeah, you know, when I'm machining, how do I do all of my, my machining and so forth? Same thing on the additive. So here are colleagues over at Hypermill, right? You know, they're, you know, the, you've got sort of, here's the weave pattern as you're, as you're weaving along and you're building up the, the, the tip, right, of, of our propeller and so forth. So again, it's a different type of strategy you have to think about. Uh, and, and also this, uh, I, I would love this, additive turning. So, yep, you know, this, again, this is in the middle, so this is spinning, right? And what you see is we're actually building this cone. Now, you want to make sure that you're printing straight down because you don't want the material to drip off because it's bolted, right? And so, but we also need some thick in here so you can see it's actually weaving back and forth and I should say so this is this is one uh, X speed I think this was what four hours reduced down to about 30 seconds so it doesn't really build that fast yet right just just so you know it was like wow I gotta get one of these no yeah, yeah they will deliver that to them next week no problem right, we gotta manage expectations yeah, manage expectations so but but anyway so so it is a different way of thinking this is not the back and forth that you think about in terms of what's going on and again, you could imagine, like with Medusa robotic system, you know, again, if you've got the spindle turning around, you're really generating this, this rotary part. You're using the precision of that rotary table as actually as opposed to any of the X, Y axes and so forth. So you can have some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, and, you know, and again, in terms of what's going on with, with uh, you know, and this actually is pretty cool. So you've got to think about this again. Look, if I'm, I'm just going to stand up here. But on the inside, I've got, clearly I've got less material, right? So our friends over at Hypermill had to think about this. Okay, if we're gonna print this out, if you zoom in over here, right, you see that I actually don't print all the way down to the end because I've gotta get more material out here, and so you work on it so that you have less material on the inside. So there's a whole different way of thinking for trajectory planning. The other thing, and, and by the way, you can see now how we're making this paddle wheel. You're printing it, and then you move it through, right? And, and, and that's, that's exactly how you do it. So you keep it moving in that direction. The, the other thing, and I don't think we did it on this one, I'm not 100% sure, but let's say this does get a little bit too hot. If it gets too hot, we can actually stop printing on that particular element of the paddle and rotate it and print on the next element. So you can keep things going along. Uh, we're also working, of course, with, with the colleagues over at Autodesk. And again, it's, it's great to have these different companies working on this. So here, typically, you would see slicing in terms of a plane. Well, if I'm gonna produce this guy, which again, you can see on our five axis, if I'm gonna produce, produce that, you're gonna do portal slicing. And to give you a feel for that, how, how long went from when we said, oh, hey, let's go design this thing to printing it and taking the picture was? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. And again, that's a fairly thin part and so forth, but it's actually pretty cool. Now, the one thing I gotta tell you is, you know, I don't think I'd want a machine that I think it'd bring like a son of a gun, right? But if you really wanted to, what you might do is you might print a little bit and then machine print a little bit, machine more, so you don't have this big, you know, hunk of material or, or like a big boring bar that you have to stick down there. So there are a lot of different things that, that you could really think about. Um, and in fact, you know, and, and then I'm gonna, I believe this is where I turned over to you after this, right? So, so, so this is also edge driven. So some of the things we look at is, look, if I'm, if I'm producing this thing, and now you can see we're building this sort of, this, this bell shape as we're tipping over. Um, I can, you know, one of our big problems, I think the, the BTC 800, that's got a eight megawatt. Right? No, make kilowatt. kilowatt. Kilowatt, megawatt, good God, yeah, we're not vaporizing things, right? <laughs> so anyways, but, but it's an eight kilowatt laser, if you think about it, it's all enclosed in there, right? And, and machine tools don't like heat. Uh, and in fact, what can happen is this thing can actually overheat and your part can start sagging in the whole bit. So we're actually, you know, we, we actually can, and we've been, you know, these, the thermal camera is not particularly expensive, I don't know, several hundred dollars. And that's something that's not directly integrated in the machine tool, but via things like MT Connect and so forth. And then we've got a, a separate PC, so we're monitoring, monitoring the temperature, and we're actually driving the machine. If the temperature gets too high, we say, hey, pause for a little bit to let it cool down. So, and, you know, so, so these are the type of things where even if the machine is not capable, doesn't have that type of sensor in it, we can integrate the sensor now and actually help to control the machine. So when we're looking at some of these things, then to really improve the control, we're not necessarily saying, okay, now you gotta buy a whole new controller, it's a whole new setup there and so forth. We, we can't integrate things together. And so what I'd like to do now, I'll turn it over to Kyle, 
And, uh, you know, he'll talk a little bit. He'll, he'll sort of move on. But here's the question. Now I'm starting to plug all sorts of stuff into my machine. I'm on the Internet and so forth. And, again, I know we got the smart box, right, which, which is, you know, great protection. But what are some of the things that you should think about and, and, you know, just some of the issues that you want to worry about? You plug your computer out into the Internet. That's okay. Your computer at home. If somebody gets to it, well, what are they going to do? But you plug your million-dollar machine tool into it. It's, it's, it's another, you know, it's another situation. So Kyle's going to talk a little bit about some of the cybersecurity stuff. Thank you very much for the introduction and for kicking things off. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Slevy. I'm an R&D staff member at Oak Ridge National Lab. And I work between the hybrid manufacturing teams and the data analytics teams. That's a, a big, fancy way for saying I'm the data guy. If you ask any one of my colleagues, oh, yeah, Kyle's the data guy. So I have a question to kind of kick things off. You don't, you don't have to raise your hands. Who all in here wants a Ferrari or a sports car? <laughs> Do you want to leave the keys taped to the hood? <laughs> you spent all this money paying, a, you know, paying an incredible amount for a quality machine, a quality set of manufacturing equipment. You put a ton of time into the operational flow of your networks, how things move quickly in and out of the shop, but we're not gonna leave the keys in the door, right? That's what we're up against. You know, I, I work very closely back, even down to the base level programming of some of these CNC equipments. And a lot of my job works on how we use them better. How do we take the information out of it, look at it on a computer, take what's, what's going on, understand it, analyze it, and feed it back in to make the process better, safer, and more efficient for all the parties involved. But doing that inherently opens up your machine to a lot of different cybersecurity attacks. Uh, so some of the stuff I'm gonna talk with, everything today is just on the front side. Well, I'll show you what's coming down the pipeline a little bit. Uh, later on in the presentation, but everything is just on the front side from your designer's workstation, making your G code, making the tool paths, designing out the programs, and simply transferring it to the system. We'll get to the feedback control in a second. But as I said before, modern CN machines are complex composite mechanical electrical systems, right? We're not talking about a personal computer where if you hack it, you may lose some bank information. If someone gets a hold of the laser on a hybrid machine, it'll kill someone. You can fire the lasers, you can get control of your equipment, you can turn the spindle on. It's incredible security vulnerabilities that some of these CNC machines pose. But the vast majority of the equipment is prone, that's prone to attack is caused by human error. Everything that's out there, there's, there's a lot of really involved cybersecurity, a lot of networking applications, and uh, Neil DeRosiers and his Smartbox team is incredible at handling some of it. But let's just take a step back and look at some of the simple stuff. Today we're going to talk about what is the initial steps. Let's not worry about the high end, the, the really complicated, just what are the first steps to prevent some of these attacks? And, and on a broad strokes, make your machines and make your operations safer. So intelligent equipment protection. You guys have all heard the IT security speeches, right? You can sum them up in basically one slide. Don't click on bad links. Check who sent the email. If it looks like it's coming from a bad place, you, know, you probably shouldn't click on it. Don't use unknown USB flash drives. And if you've suddenly inherited a fortune from a foreign relative, you probably haven't, right? That's, these are all gimmies, right? But let's, let's go a little bit level deeper. Let's take it one more step further and say, what is the actionable things that you can do? Talk about information transfer, like I said, computer to G code, some of your machine and IP protection, how you look at your shop setups, the networking side, and then finally, just common sense. Training the operators, the managers, people who touch the machines to think about what they're doing and question and understand what is really going into this process and save a tremendous amount of effort later on. Um, this is probably one of my favorite pictures of all time. It's really convenient and it's great to charge your phone in the machine, but uh, I mean, you know, th this should cause a little bit of worry when we're plugging in our phones into our multi-million dollar pieces of equipment, right? Right there, coming out of the start. So, USB flash drives, common USB flash drives. Everyone here has probably taken piece of G-code, stuck it on whatever flash drive was in their pocket, plugged it into the machine, transferred the program, and kicked it off the ground without a second thought, right? It's common, it's easy. <laughs> Freebie and Ford made USB flash drives from a trade show. I know I'm hitting a little close to home here, right? This is something that's very common that's out there that you can pick them up everywhere. How many people have a common pool of flash drives sitting in someone's tool cabinet? You go grab the next nearest one, plug it into your machine, keep going on your way. And finally, unencrypted open access. 
these are things that you can clearly see other vulnerabilities. Let's not get in the way of production. Let's not get in the way and make things overly burdened for the operators. But let's do a little bit. Let's find the right balance here so that we can make this a convenient, but yet still productive operation. The first thing is to reformat the flash drives. If you pick up a flash drive for here from a trade show, it's, it's not the company's fault. They're not trying to put malware. They're not trying to do anything. It just happens. They get on from some stage in the process. So going in there, reformat all the flash drives. It wipes the data, it gives you control over it, and you know everything that has gone on to that USB removal drive and everything that is coming off of it. Next thing is to name the flash drive. Use with only one machine. If a machine is to be broken into, if you are compromised, you want to isolate your networks as much as you can. You don't want that to be transferred back and forth to all of your different machines. One flash drive, one machine, named. You know what's going on to it, you know what's coming out of it. And finally, consider encryption. That gets a little painful. It's, it's really annoying sometimes to type in the numbers every time you use your flash drive. It might be valuable on some of your really high-end components, but once again, we're trying to strike the balance. We're trying to understand what is useful. Let's take out 90% of the attacks, and then we'll get to the high-level stuff. Um, a couple other options, plug only USB drives. You can actually plug and lock these out of your systems. Uh, you can prevent people from even loading on USB removable media drives to there. Uh, you can also make data only cores. You know, a lot of operators love plugging their phone. I, I love plugging my phone into the machine to charge it. It's really convenient. You have data only core, I'm sorry, you have power only cords that physically take out the two data pins on a standard USB. That's an elegant solution, right? You get the power cord and it physically hardwire prevents anything from being transferred. And finally, there's a couple of other things that, that, that'll help on terms of the hardware side of locking out uh, these ports of the machine. Information transfer, shop network. This is really more of my bread and butter. A lot of what we do allows us to take sensors inside the machine, like a thermal IR camera, pull that out, analyze it in near real time on a system, and feed back in updated instructions to the machine. By necessity, you have to have an internet connected machine. Monitored operations are coming. This is one of the necessities for hybrid manufacturing. It allows us for a lot of increased capability uh, in terms of some of the automated machine control technologies. This is coming down the pipeline and it will get there eventually to a standard CNC machine. So let's get ahead of the curve. What we, we can't just disconnect all the machines and never look at them yet. It's, it's just not possible, it's not practical. So let's get ahead of the system and understand what's going into it. Some of the bad, the bad practices, using Dropbox to share G code files. The nice thing is that these are internet connected, but once again, a single file on, all, on one of your systems gets transferred to all of the other systems. There are other mechanisms out there. Uh, Windows has a great one, a variety of other software platforms that give you a secured, encrypted, and credential-based file sharing software. Um, I can give you some of the company names later on if you like, just come, come find me. Um, but using Dropbox just as a service level gives you a lot of risk. Connecting all the machines on the same network is your personal phones, your guest Wi-Fi, and the ones that, and the computers that you take emails in and out on. Have an isolated network. Uh, once again, I'll call out the smart box, and uh, some of Mazak's team is incredible at helping people set this up and, and, and getting that in a secure and protective manner. And finally, leaving all the IP addresses and everything enabled. This, this gets in a little bit into the IT, but the summary is that your computers and your routers and your managers and broadband networks have incredible capabilities that you're never going to use for a CNC machine. Lock them out. Don't allow them to be used. Only enable what you need protect against all the rest. Right there will cut out a lot of the cybersecurity attacks. Um, who, who's never changed the default password? That's kind of a given, right? You're once again leaving the keys in the door. Um, many CNC machines have identical file structures, they have identical root passwords, they have a lot of stuff that, that promotes opportunity for attack. Change these, give a credential-based user account. So a couple of other things, like we said, we've talked about the Maze Act, we've talked about all the data that comes out, and there's really only two ways to get data back in, G-code and some of the low-level inputs. A couple of these specific uh, capabilities can help prevent against the attacks. Um, the biggest one I want to call out here is the specific operator and user credentials. On most shops, you can walk up to a CNC machine, poke the buttons, change anything you want, load files, change media, stick in a USB flash drive. Just by giving a user-based credential, allowing the simple management keys or giving a login right there, it's not, it's not to track the employees, it's not to track operators, it's not to call out who's wrong and who's right. 
is to prevent people who aren't trusted on your team from getting access and changing things on the system. That in itself also enables a lot of management-based productivity and security. So I wanted to call it out, that's, a, that's one, of the, one of the easiest and most uh, fail-safe things that you can do to, to protect them inside of the text. I said I would go through this you know, kind of really quickly and we would only focus on that first workflow. The vast majority of CNC operations you know, really only need to take G-code, put it on a flash drive, put it somewhere, transfer it to your system, run it on a machine and be done. But what's coming in terms of the digital era, as uh, Dr. Curtis mentioned, is an entire other evaluation system that monitors your machines, that understands what's going on in them. Like again, taking it out to a computer, analyzing it, updating instructions, and feeding it back in. And by doing this, by, by enabling these extra productivity, these extra capabilities, um, you know, once again, we're enabling the cyber attack. So by getting ahead of the curve, by, by looking at some of the things and paying them off early, we can start to integrate some of these other measurements, some of these other analytical tools, and make shops more productive. So what's coming down the pipeline? You know, what's out there in the future? We've talked about the, the, the kind of the level, the easy stuff to do to prevent cyber attacks. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with a new manufacturing USA Institute called Cymani. It's the Cybersecurity Manufacturing Innovation Institute. And they look at energy of the system, what all is going into it, you know, taking OEE really to the next level. By looking at your OE metrics, the same base data, the load of the system, how it's being used, the timeline, we can create what's called an energy signature of manufacturing. This is the thumbprint. This is every time you make a part, that gives you a nice little curve, a nice couple of plots that show this is where the spindle is, this is where the position is, this is what's happening on the load of each of the axes, and together that gives you a picture of what that part should look like. Now let's bring that out over time you can start to detect changes to those parts. So if you look at it, moving down into our histograms right here, you can see that something was changed in relation to all the others. And we can start to detect cyber attacks and detect changes to our machine. You can clearly tell if you crash your machine, it's gonna make a loud bang, you're gonna have a bad spindle, and a lot of things happen. But what if you were to change the center of rotation of your fifth axis table? Just a few microns, very hard to detect very hard to recalibrate and understand what's happening. These are some of the more subtle attacks that are starting, you know, that, that are starting to be to be used and to come into mind when you're looking at attacking CNC machines. Some of these techniques, the energy signature, over time aggregating the statistics will help to identify that and prevent uh, preventing its unwanted intrusions. Um, like I said, I, I get to work with Simani. That's a fantastic uh, program. I highly recommend you know, reaching out to them, working with your base at representatives as well from the smart boxes. And finally, the last thing I want to say is, is, is looking at common sense. The, the amount of cyber attacks that happen on a daily basis are, are absolutely incredible. I mean, just from the simple number of emails, from the simple number of bad links, uh, from the, just a text message on a phone, you click a link, it, the number out there is just absolutely astounding. By helping people to think, to really understand what they're doing, to, to question, is this a safe operation? Is this what I, what I should be doing? That, that, that can head off a lot of headache and a lot of trouble for your companies uh, later on in the future. Um, and finally, I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, um, I didn't get into all the details of the smart box and the way that it can isolate networks and, and really secure some of this. I highly recommend reaching out to your main sector to talk about it. It's a fantastic product and uh, it provides a lot of a higher level security. Um, so, Kind of to summarize things up before I turn back over to Dr. Kerfus, you know, there's, there's really a, a favorite season for cyber attackers out there, and that's a fishing season. So don't be the one that takes the first bite. Well, outstanding. I thought I had to mark it on bad jokes. So. <laughs> I guess not. Um, so yeah, so and, and again, just just I mean, in terms of thinking about this, like what what should your energy signature look like? Think about it. If I'm just just milling a part, if I'm going over a hole in that part, you know that your power, your spindle power is going to drop because I'm not machining there. Did that spindle power drop at the right location and so forth? Right. And those are the things you're thinking about. We have even pick things up like, gosh, my hardness is off. We had the wrong we we had the wrong heat treatment on this thing, and so I have you know I have a much higher spindle power than I expected. And so we picked up you know heat treating issues. Now that's not to say that it's super easy to do, right? I mean, is it a heat treating issue, right? Is the material a little harder, or maybe I've got a duller tool and so forth? 
So, you know, again, these are things that these are things that you think about. So what I'd like to do now is kind of go into what we call talk about is the democratization of, of advanced manufacturing. So we've got all this great technology. And look, if, if I'm from a, a you know a Lockheed Martin or a GM or a Ford and so forth, Boeing, they've got a lot of engineering know-how and capability. They're utilizing the latest and greatest tools. They've they've got, you know, they've they've got the latest controller out of ASAC, the smooth controller, the AI controller and so forth. Um, and, and they're really utilizing it. But you're buying these too, right? And you may not have a whole bunch of PhDs who, who know how to use these machines, but you've got the equipment. Why don't you use it, right? It's again, it's like having the Ferrari, right? You know, and, and keeping it under the speed limit. Uh, well, you know, at five miles an hour the speed limit. We all keep it under the speed limit, right? You know, but, but the idea is like, how do you bring it all out there? And so really, you've got you know secure design and production of your of your information. Make sure your customer's information is is is, is safe. Uh, when that turbine blade shows up, and let's say Delta Tech Ops in uh, in Atlanta, if you fly through Atlanta, you'll see all of the planes being worked on there. They do engine work and so forth. When that blade shows up, you want to make sure that it's not a counterfeit blade. It's genuine. So if I have all the digital information from production, not only do I know that it's it's genuine, but nobody has tampered with the process, right? Uh, you know, again, you could imagine in particular, and actually, you know, here's our curtain plate. As, let's say, you know, ultimately we will be able to print these up, and we actually have printed them up, and we can actually control the microstructure of the blade as we're printing it. So frankly speaking, I would rather have that blade that's 3D printed than machine than the cast one, because who knows what's sitting inside the casting. Yeah, you could do tomography and so forth, but I can tell you exactly what's going on, and every, instead of a pixel, it's a voxel, a three-dimensional pixel, I can tell you what's going on in there. But I can also tell you, you know what happens if I'm putting that material down and somebody just tweaks down, right? MIG, metal inert uh, uh, gas, right? You know, welding. So if, if, if that gas just goes off for just a little bit, what happens? You get a little oxidation in there. If that happens at the root of your blade, maybe it's okay until you're on afterburn. Let's say in a serious combat situation and then it blows apart. That's a really bad thing to do. That's where somebody could tweak up, you know, tweak something up and really cause some difficulties. So again, it shows up, digital passport, it is born qualified. I know that it's good. Um, you know, but look, there are a lot of legacy systems out there. Those are the systems that are a little bit older and so forth. So we can put a lot of these sensing systems on there. We can interface with the controllers. I mean, MT Connect has been around a long time. It's been running on, for example, Mazak machines for quite some time. So we can leverage all of that. Uh, again, storing uh, critical information in a secure location, whether it's production information. So, hey, here's here's the information on my, <coughs> excuse me, turbine blade, you know, or here's how I'm making my turbine blade. Right? And, and by the way, everybody thinks about this in terms of 3D printing, but I think we all know we've got our secret sauce for machining as well. Kyle said, yeah, dangerous. You don't want the laser going on. You know, you don't want the spindle going on either, right? So, I, I mean, it, whatever maps, whatever you think about 3D printing, you can map it back to machining to our more traditional processes. So, so, so how do we sort of bring all this together in terms of a new, sort of maybe a new business model? So look, okay, we're, we're all here, uh, you know, at Discover and so forth. So what would happen if uh, you know you do something like Uber? So now Mazak sells machines. So we, we've got uh, we've got people who say, Hi, I'd like to put a, a Mazak in my garage, and I can sell the machines. Well, where am I going to get the business? Well, think about it. Uh, you know, I, I want to give people rides to and from the airport. Where am I going to get the business? Well, Uber makes that connection for you. And the beauty of it is when Uber makes the connection, you know that this person is going to be able to get you back and forth. You know, you see how much it's going to cost, how they're going to take you. not being taken for a ride. You always get a little bit nervous with these taxi cab riders. Um, but are they really going to be able to know how to do this? Well, it's the same thing with the Uber driver. The look at the Uber driver needs to know how to drive the car. But they don't need to know how to get to my precise house from the airport. That's the taxi cab driver. She needed to know how to do that but now, Google Maps tells you how to do it. And even better, it's not just Google Maps tells you, here's how you go, here are the directions. Real-time feedback from what's going on out there. So if there's an accident, rush hour, whatever, they'll get there, they'll get you there, and they provide the rider with all that information. Yeah, okay, I can see I'm getting there, we're being rerouted, et cetera, et cetera. So they provide expertise. So now imagine, Nasek says, yeah, we can, you know, we've got a job for you, we can send it out to you, we can get you the materials, we'll tell you what the tooling looks like, we can even verify, right? We we're talking to the, you know, we're, you know, hyper I, I know you guys are out there. You are, you know. Hey, we can verify that you got the right tooling in there, and, and maybe it's AI, or maybe it's a person on the other end where it says, okay, everything is here. We got the green light. You're good to go. But now Ford needs 500 parts tomorrow, 
Now you can say, okay, Ford, yeah, we can get the material out, we can get it all, we can have those 500 parts to you, and they're all verified. We know we used the right tooling, everything was right, we can send the digital passport with it. 500 parts is a lot in a day. But guess what? I could do 10 shops locally with 50 parts. Now, and if one of those shops burns down or has a power problem or COVID or whatever it might be, I still got 49 other shops, so now I've got a resilient product. But it's at the point of assembly, so you're not gonna be competing with foreign companies because hey if I want it tomorrow and I can tell you Ford or BMW or GM or Boeing if they can order the part today and get it tomorrow you know and it costs them a little bit more because they don't have to wait for weeks and you know what about ah uh -huh, right I think we all know supply chain you know disruptions right so now you don't worry about it it's right there locally so you can put all this together and then it shows up you don't need to inspect it you know it's good and so that's a whole new business model and then how are you paying for your machine well, just like you know, Uber and GM, they have the deal where, okay, you buy the GM car and the first you know, X hundred dollars of your Uber trips and so forth go to pay off the car. I said in, 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 in cars where the driver said, yeah, I'm just doing this, as, this is my quote unquote free car. Uh, and and uh, you know, once, I, once I pay for the car, then I, I stop driving unless I want to drive around a little bit or whatever. Same type of thing over here. We keep that machine moving along and so forth. And we keep that machine updated. Do you need to be the expert? Not the super expert, because you've got expertise elsewhere that's gonna help you out. And, and maybe it's artificial intelligence? We, we were talking about this. Okay, well, we really want the part. This we were just talking about saying, we really want the part over at Hypermill, right? You know, well, does the part need to be, how should it be oriented? Well, if it's like this, maybe we want to kind of orient it this way if I'm machining it here so all the chips fall out. If it's a little bit this way, the chips might get caught. And again, that's something where you start to look at it and people will say, okay, I kind of see how all this comes together. And so you actually improve your understanding and your knowledge and your know-how but the people are not gonna go away. So, so it's great, it really leverages a well-trained workforce, but you don't have to worry about a lot of the nitty gritty detail. And we've been doing this in aerospace. You know, F-35 pilot, F-16, F-18 pilot, all the heads up displays and so forth to avoid the cognitive overloading. Help them out. You know, we think about AI, not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. So, and that's sort of the, I wanna point this out. So, okay, you know, the lights out factory. You know, I gotta love the lights out factory. That's typically third shift, right? And what do they do? They spend all second shift loading up all the pallets and so forth so they can run this thing all automated, right? And then what do they do? The first thing in first shift, unload everything and so to all the people. Are. People are really important. So it's not about, and I, I was testifying in front of Congress and I said, hey, when are we gonna get the robot that loads and loads of dishwasher? And I think we all know our robots. I don't think I'd ever trust a robot with bike china, you know, uh, you know. I mean, uh, I guess we're hearing about new, new aluminum plates and stuff like that, so maybe with the aluminum stuff, but look, you can't, I think we, if you mess with robots, it's hard to get a peg in a hole. You think you get a load their dishwasher up and so forth and think about it. You know, hey, I know my dishwasher doesn't like mustard, right? It won't get mustard off. So if I see mustard, I see mustard with my vision, my eyes, I'll rinse it off, do a little pre-processing, stick it in there. Just, you can't be the human being there. But we have gotten rid of the nasty job of washing the dishes, right? So nobody wants to wash dishes. Now people complain, I know my kids do. They'll have to really load and unload the dishwasher. <laughs> But it's way better than when I was a kid, walking, you know, uphill and snow both ways to school, you know, uh, washing the dishes. But I will tell you this, and so this is a little bit of a computer science show, so, uh, you know, is, and that is that there are 10 types of people out there, okay? You know, those that understand binary and, and, and those that don't, okay? And that's it, all right? So, so and, and again, this is something that you got a computer science friend, they absolutely love this thing. But, but it really is, that really is the case. You've got to have an understanding of computers and so forth, but people do. Look, you know, don't have my smartphone or leave that. Here it is, yeah. My mother, going out to lunch, right? Should I bring an umbrella? Brings up her little weather app and looks at all this sort of stuff. She is accessing a constellation of NOAA satellites beaming terabytes of data down that are being integrated with tons of data from ground Doppler weather radar into the latest and greatest NOAA supercomputing models running on maybe Amazon Web Services, somebody else and so forth to tell her whether to bring an umbrella. My mom is accessing all this technology and what you're seeing out there in terms of ease of use, it's moving in that direction. So it's not just about our next generation workforce, but it's about our current generation workforce. So I'll, I'll wrap up with this last one. And there's my, my friend Medusa. Uh, on the upper one, you can see the big rotary turntable moving and they're actually operating in a coordinated fashion. They're, they're printing a square there, so it's a little bit uh, different than the cylinder. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, they're actually they're, they're operating in three independent uh, elements. It's pr pr producing three different parts or, or part, three different uh, features of the same part on the same part. 
But in terms of really the big picture, digital thread is a two-way street. It's a great opportunity to get information out so we can qualify things, we can understand our processes better. But it's also great in terms of getting information back to the worker. Think about it. You know, you've got to put your uh, uh, safety glasses on. What if they were extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality? So that even if you're just looking down, hey, I you know, machine this part, I'm unloading this part. If that thing looked at it and said, oh, hey, that part didn't clean up. I just, it's just so the worker doesn't have to deal with it. Okay, I'm dealing with all sorts of things. I might miss the fact that the part didn't clean up. It could just tell you that, hey, didn't clean up, right? Um, it allows us to deploy things rapidly, really faster, again, faster than the competition can come. We can get technology out there. We can get people trained up to use that technology. We can learn what's going on. But the human is always a starting point. Make no mistake. We're never going to replace a human. Not only I'm thinking of things. We were thinking. We're talking about even in terms of you know again with, with our friends over at the, at the Hiker Mill. You know, so you know you've got all sorts of choices there in terms of what you want to do with your machine. You know, hey, do I want to you know 180 degrees, zero, 270, 90, and so forth. So the humans probably actually said, let's start with 90 and sort of see where it goes. The machine might bounce around, AI might bounce around a little bit, maybe get caught in the corner, and you, you kick it out and say, yeah, no, you don't want to go there, let's go there. So, so it's going to be really the conjunction of those guys working together. And you really want to leverage cloud and fog and edge. Again, e even, even on, on uh, um, you know, I, I know you, you, know, you, you have ping Dropbox and so forth, but look, if you're storing stuff out on Dropbox and you have the professional version, whatever, and this, I mean, all of them are, are the same way. If you do click on a bad link and everything gets encrypted, I was just talking to somebody about this over here the other day. Yeah, I, I just, you know, we, I think we talked about it over dinner. I, I just rewound it to yesterday, or I knew when I did this and I just told Dropbox, hey, reset me to three hours ago, and, and you're good to go, right? So, so really, leveraging that type of capability is, is, is really the way to go. Actually, Kelly, it was, he was just showing me his, his uh, tablet sitting on one of the on one of the machine tools out there on the floor you know now i'm bringing the you know extra computational power right to the machine right and so you've got a lot of flexibility that's going on there and so forth uh but as Colin was talking about you got to weave in the cyber security you want to take advantage of all these things you really want to make sure that you're cyber secure you know one of the things i see and i'll just i'll just give you a heads up on this i think a lot of us use our cell phones you know and say okay hey if i'm logging into the bank account and you want to do a double check or whatever send me a text code etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so one of the things they do tell you is don't share your mobile phone, just don't, don't have it out there because that's just another, not quite as bad as your social security number, but putting it out there because that's how we're doing a lot of double verification or dual authentication today. Um, you know, we, we want to be able to, you know, whether it's, we talk about classified information, but even proprietary information. So I can now drive that machine, right? So you think about it, Ford wants that, now, those 500 parts, we can send that information to the machine, but it can be encrypted, so nobody can actually get that information out of it, but we know that it's being used correctly. Um, you know, and, and the bottom line is where this goes, and it has to go this way, if we can bring a lot of those parts and so forth for the tier three, four, five suppliers back to the small, medium-sized enterprises, the mom and pop shops, this is what strengthens the backbone of the U.S. manufacturing ecosystem, the mom and pop shops that are located all across the country that should be supplying our OEMs. And it can be done, and we can make sure they do it safely and in the most efficient manner possible. So with that being said, again, it's still really important that you've got your people out there. So I'll close with a quote from my favorite, favorite 20th century philosopher. Uh, and really, this, this speaks to make sure you're investing in your people so they can use the latest and greatest capabilities on the smooth controller, the AI controller. So this guy, Eric Hoffer, back in the 20th century, and I love this. My, my colleagues in academia, the professors, sometimes they get a little nervous about this. But look, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. You know, and, and that was true in the 20th century. Think about how rapidly technology is changing today. It was true in the 20th century, and I'm not sure it's the right thing of the proper English, but that's okay, I'm an engineer. But it is truer, or is it more true, today because of the rapid change of pace of technology and how we're going to be moving things forward. So it's, it's an exciting time. We can move forward. We can do it in a secure fashion. And I think it could be very, very good for U.S. manufacturing. So with that, I'll ask Kyle to join me for some questions, if you have any. Thank you. Yeah, we've got um, we got a few minutes for questions. So uh, if anybody, uh, I, I know I do have one, um, and, it, and it's really from the perspective of that small either startup, you know, job shop or 
or um, um, job shop that's been in business for a little while may have a couple of uh, Mazak VCEZs sitting side by side running the same parts every day, but for some reason they're only they're getting about 50% utilization um, and, and output on one and 65% utilization and output on the other, but they're not sure, they're not quite sure why or how. How, how does a small job shop take that first step into data collection to figure out how to improve their processes to get that utilization and output up? Sure, and um, I, you know, Tom can take a shot at it too, but I think the, the reality there is, and, and we've seen this, uh, so I can tell you that working for, for some, some very large manufacturers where they have three machines making the same product you know, right next to each other and, and, and one is doing better than the other two. And so, you know, what's happening over there? And again, you go through your standard studies in terms of your, you know, SPC, statistical process control. But the, the question really is in the small shop, you might not have the expertise. So, so this is where, and you see this, for example, you're, you know, you're, you're spindle health monitoring. So you're monitoring that spindle health elsewhere. So look, you come to a company like Mazak, or maybe it's a third party, it doesn't really matter, but you're getting the information off of the machine. Let's feed it to the third party and say, okay, well, what's going on and so forth? How are we moving it forward? Now look, I can't say that you're always, it's like telemedicine, right? Are you gonna be able to dial into your doctor or you know, stick out your tongue to your webcam and they're gonna say, oh, here's your problem. But the idea really is, okay, well, hey, let's try this, let's look at this, you know, make it sure and so forth. It, if nothing else, what this does is the expert that you're, that you're tying into, and sometimes it's, it's, it's something that is happening uh, really behind the scenes, right? If, if you're really tied in there, you're not saying, oh, gosh, I got a problem. That's being noticed for you, so somebody's monitoring for you. If nothing else, it provides the expert a whole bunch of things that are not the problems. These things are all okay, et cetera, et cetera. We do need to come in here and do some further diagnostics. So again. Some simpler things, you know, where, where you might not need a human or you might not need a human right there, but then it also basically says, okay, and here's the type of expert we need to get in there and so forth and, and, and get it going. So, so there's a great opportunity there. I don't know if Kyle, you wanted to, to add on to that or not. Or... Yeah, absolutely. So um, the two things that I would say, first of all, consider the things that are unexpected. You know, it's, it's a little hard to do. It's a little intuitive, right? I'll share a quick story of one of our EV machines at Oak Ridge National. Um, we had a system like that, that it was only one of them. Wait, 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 can you tell us what an EV machine is? Oh, uh, yes. An electron beam machine, which is an additive system where you have different powders that are blended together and zapped to create a profile that's built up over time. Uh, so an electron beam, it's highly uh, susceptible to a magnetic field or any ferrous material. We had a part that for two months was working flawlessly. Incredible part, great process, dialed in, perfect process control. And all of a sudden, our productivity was trash. It just fell through the floor. We couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, so we started actually taking, uh, collecting a little bit of data from it. Um, it had some proprietary format. And finally, someone put a webcam on the system. And there was an operator that was bringing a steel cart next to the machine. Nothing that the machine was doing wrong, nothing that was, that was causing it. A steel cart next to it changed magnetic field thereby trash the parts on certain times of the day. So it's stuff that, that may not be internal to the machine, but they consider the unexpected. So the last thing I'd say in terms of that is uh, MT Connect is an extremely valuable diagnostic tool. If it's an easy system, an easy controller, I know for a fact it has the MT Connect capability, right. and uh, that can be enabled uh, for, for a, a high level diagnostics, and there's a variety of people that can do that. But, but think, think a little bit outside the box. Yeah, but let me just, just as a follow on, when I worked for a U.S. berry company a long time ago, we, we ran into a similar situation where like in the mornings, the machine couldn't hold tolerance in the whole bed. And then in the afternoon, it was like perfect. It was just, you know, and the same thing, instead of the metal cart rolling by, guess what? Somebody had plugged a coffee maker in next to this thing, right? And so, you know, in the morning when they're brewing coffee, it's generating a lot of heat and screwing everything up, right? I mean, again, you know, it's just like, okay, yeah, you could just see that, right? Yeah. So is this, this is not a modern problem. It's a problem even in, in machining and grinding. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Thank you for a good presentation. Uh, my name is Colin. I hope it's not The question I have is about uh, network security. What's the difference between having a physical firewall, a part of the network firewall device, and creating DMZs, having network segmentation between your factory floor and your enterprise, and having a smart box? So I'll, I will turn the in-depth smart block questions over to a, a Mazak expert. I think the physical firewall is a much a much stronger approach, in my opinion. Um, it makes 
development and it makes changes and makes any, any tweaks that you want a lot harder to do. Whereas a, a Mazak smart box, in my opinion, has already the capability in the process to add extra equipment. It has the safe ways to add in an extra machine or to run a process on the isolated side of the network and still get your data out in a secure way. Um, so I think it's a little more elegant approach. It allows you more flexibility in the future instead of just cutting everything off and not allowing anything out. Uh, that, that's my opinion on the matter, but I'll once again turn it over to a, a true Mazak expert. Maybe you got anything to add? <laughs> uh, uh, hardware and firewalling is obviously uh, less susceptible to malware attacks on it than like a software firewall that can be manipulated by malware locally. You get you get off the controller, you get to the point where you're doing hardware uh, firewall and you it's still off the security. All right, thank you. Yeah, and, and by the way, this just sort of adding on when you talk about EMZs and, and so forth. You know, this is another one. Look, you've got your office, and, and people in the office, you know, not only you shouldn't be surfing the web from your machine tool, although I know some people do, et cetera, but in the office, okay, there's more connection with the outside world. So, and Kyle mentioned this talk, yeah, so maybe you should have a separate you know, network for your office and for your shop, and so forth. So, so they really are, and then now you do have a physical, really physical gear gap and so forth. And is that particularly expensive? No, not too bad, right? And again, I, I wouldn't recommend, this is where, again, you look inside the, the smart box, you've got some, some serious industrial Cisco routers sitting inside of there, right? So I wouldn't recommend going off of, you know, to Amazon or whatever, just ordering the, the cheapest, lowest cost router, things like that. By the way, if, if you haven't changed your password on your router, your username is admin and your password is password, right? So <laughs> <laughs> make sure you do that. Good. All right, we got time for one more. Any, uh, yeah. Uh, talking about security, So I, I don't have a hard statistic for you uh, off the top of my head. I will say the publication of those attacks has dramatically increased. Uh, now that, that's for one reason or another, right? There, there's a number of cybersecurity attacks and you hear about them that reaction um, The reason for this could be embarrassment, it could be other national security interests. Uh, but for some reason, there is a huge amount of increase in the publication of those attacks. In, in my opinion, one of the most interesting things about it is you can now start to identify how susceptible everything else is. So by nature of knowing they're out there, right, now that everyone is aware of them, it's brought it up to public's attention, and particularly manufacturing, you need to start protecting against it. So Simani was, was created specifically for that with the manufacturing community. Um, I know for a fact there's been a, a wide range of attacks against high value targets on manufacturing, and those are one of the particular areas that, that, that we really want to avoid. Uh, some examples of those are the silicon wafer technologies, aerospace, and other critical infrastructure like military defense. And I'll, I'll just add, so part of the reason that we have seen more reported is, is that it's encouraged. It's, it's sort of like if you have break-ins in your neighborhood, right? I mean, yeah, you really don't want to talk about it and so forth, but it's good to publicize it, right? You see it in the paper, now people are more vigilant, you've got more focus on it and so forth. It is embarrassing when your company gets broken into. But look, that's that's not your fault and so forth. I mean, these things do happen. But again, if you if you put it out there and say, yeah, this has happened, okay, everybody's now more vigilant and, and, and looking at it. Uh, and, and frankly speaking, I think the other reason that we see just an increase in attacks is you just had an increase in connectivity, right? I, I mean, people, there's more and more broadband out there. We're going to 5G, 5G is what? You know, 10 or 100 times faster, that means what? 10 or 100 times more cyber attacks and so forth. So, so it's just getting easier and easier you know, to, for, for, those, for those cyber criminals to get out there and, and start to cause difficulty. Or again, just, just poking around. Not even cause it, just poking around to see what they're gonna learn out there, to see what they can find out. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just how you're gonna do it. And that's why, again, we, we stay ahead. The firewall is great, but there are always ways around it. So we always have to keep updating and so forth. And again, by saying, yep, I was broken into, now we can learn from that and we can start to plug those gaps and, and stay ahead of that competition, if you will. Yeah, great, great, thank you. Um, yeah, just, just a side note, <clears throat> the factory floor across the street, there are no USBs on that factory floor and all the assets are isolated. Um, the information going in and out are isolated with the Mazak smart box. Can, can I just, and I forgot to say this, so, so, so Kyle was talking about Simani and so forth. If you go to Manufacturing USA, just look up Manufacturing USA. There are a bunch of different institutes that look at digital manufacturing, additive manufacturing, uh, cybersecurity, and so forth. They are there for the federal government to help 
U.S. manufacturing, from the large players down to the small and medium-sized enterprises. Take a peek over there. If there's something you know that, that could help out, so forth, reach out to them. That's what they're there for. So, so do that. That's going on at the Department of Commerce. Okay, great. Hey, thank you so much, guys. Another round of applause.